Why is this Western when over 140 countries in the General Assembly voted to condemn this invasion? It is not important for us who was voting what way, uh, because uh, all these votes, I know how the uh, Americans and the Brits and some Europeans uh, are getting those votes. I have many friends in, in New York, and when these resolutions were voted, I asked, why did they vote this way? And they told me, you know, being a bit ashamed, you understand that I have worked here for 10 years, uh, my kids are in Stanford, and before the vote, uh, they came to me and said, don't forget about that your kids are studying the, and don't forget that your bank account is in such and such bank. So your, Wait your a contention second. You, is that no, 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 my, all, my, most my, of these countries no, no, no. were pressured by the United States? Not most, all of them. This is my video update on this Wednesday midday, January the 24th. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with New Hampshire and the victory from Trump in the New Hampshire primary. He beat out neocon Nikki Haley about 54% to like 43, 44%. That was the, the end result of the New Hampshire primary. A Trump victory was expected. But uh, Nikki Haley, neocon Nikki, she ended up doing better than expected. And the reason she did better than expected is because a whole bunch of Democrats came out to vote for neocon Nikki. So that was it. That is the reason that she ended up with like 43 or 44% because of the Democrat vote. TDS, Trump derangement syndrome. It affects a lot of people, TDS. So uh, yeah, that was, the, that was the vote in New Hampshire. Neocon Nikki, she came out with a speech after, uh, after they called it for Trump. And uh, she congratulated Trump, but she said that this contest has just started and she is going to stay in the race, heading to South Carolina, her home state. So obviously, Neocon Nikki, she is, she is going to sit tight and she is going to remain in this primary because her her puppet masters the people that are really pulling the strings they have told her to stay in the race so she's going to remain where she is who knows what they've told her who knows what they've promised her but i'm sure they're telling her just sit tight sit tight nikki and we will get some lawfare and some more indictments or God knows what else to uh, to make sure that Trump is is no longer an issue, and you are the only one left for the Republican nomination for president. And Nikki Haley is, without a doubt, the unit party's number one choice. So that is the news out of New Hampshire. And how about that audio recording from? The Arizona GOP chair, Jeff, Jeff DeWitt, and Carrie Lake. How about that audio recording? Wow, wow, that was something else. So I don't know if you guys uh, listened to that audio recording, but uh, the, A the AZ GOP chairman, Jeff DeWitt, tried to bribe Carrie Lake in a nine minutes audio recording, nine, 10 minutes, and uh, five minutes is, is there's, a, there's like a five minute audio recording that's that's gone viral, but you can also search for the full like nine, 10 minutes of this audio recording. It's, it's all over Twitter and Telegram and, and wow, this AZ GOP chairman, he basically told Carrie Lake, look, 
can you just uh, disappear for a couple of years? Take a pause. Take a pause for a couple of years, he told her. And uh, there's people that are willing to pay a lot of money for you to, to pause all of your, your political uh, ambitions and aspirations. I believe she's running for, for the Senate right now. But uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that was some audio recording. Let's see here. Colin Rugg, the Twitter X account of Colin Rugg. Breaking Arizona Republican Party chair Jeff DeWitt caught on secret recordings trying to bribe Carrie Lake not to run for the Senate. Uh, quote, there are very powerful people who want to keep you out, DeWitt said. At one point during the secret recording, Lake was asked to name her number. DeWitt said, just say, is there a number at which Lake then replied, I can be bought, question mark? That's what it's about. And DeWitt replied, you can take a pause for a couple of years. You can go right back to what you're doing. Lake then said, this is not about money. It's about our country. And it goes on for, for nine, ten minutes. And uh, <laughs> man, oh man, this guy is like telling Carrie Lake, take a pause. Um, there's, we, can, we can put her on some sort of... Uh, we can find some sort of uh, of, of position position for you as a, as a board member of a company or or get you a position a job in some uh, big corporation. There are people willing to pay a lot of money for you to take a pause. And, and Carrie Lake, you got to hand it to her. She's like f no. She's like f no. This is much bigger than uh, than any money that you can give me. She's like what a million dollars. $10 million, a billion dollars. She's like, there's not enough money to buy me off. So you got to really hand it to Carrie Lake. I mean, she is going to come out of this audio recording looking really, really good. A lot of integrity. She showed a lot of integrity. And well, the GOP, the GOP chairman from Arizona, yeah, he's, he's toast. And he even mentioned that all of this I mean, he, he, he hinted at the fact that all of this is, are, is, um, is being directed by, by back east. That's what he said. This is all from back east. And, and during the nine-minute recording, like the longer version, which you have to search for the longer version, but it's out there. I like the nine-minute mark, the nine-minute, nine 30-second mark. Uh, he, he actually says, this guy, this GOP chairman actually says, if any of this gets out, then I'm, I'm toast. I'm, they're like going to blow up my car, I think he said, or, or kill me or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure who he's referencing when he's saying that they're going to kill me, but wow, 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 wow. The corruption is off, off the scales, man. It is just incredible the amount of corruption in, in politics in general, but in U.S. politics. If this is happening in the Republican Party, you know, it's happening um, in, in the Democrat Party, if not 10 times more in the Democrat Party. I mean, unbelievable stuff. It makes you wonder what happened in, uh, in Arizona during the, the governor's race. It really does make you wonder because everyone thought that Carrie Lake had it all uh, sealed up. They thought that she was going to, to be the governor of Arizona and she didn't win. But um, man... This recording is incredible. Go look for it. Listen to it. And I think it gives you a, a, an incredible insight as to how politics in the United States works. And this is Republican to Republican. The GOP chair of Arizona to Carrie Lake, who is uh, running for Senate in Arizona. This is how they treat each other. Or this is what the GOP, this is how the GOP treats one of their, their most popular uh, representatives, one of those, their most popular uh, candidates in Carrie Lake. This is how they treat her. You know she scares them when they want to uh, buy her off. And that's how it works. It's a book deal. It's your own show on Fox News or MSNBC or 
or CNN. It's um, it, it's a position on on the board of the uh, of a company, of a big company. Uh, look at look at Obama, look at the Obamas, right? They they were there for eight years as president, and and then they got that ninety or a hundred million dollar production deal with Netflix. <laughs> The Obamas producing movies and documentaries. That's how it works. They either buy you off so you don't run, or you're a faithful servant to whatever they tell you to do. And then when you're done with your tenure as as, uh, as senator or, or president or whatever, then you get rewarded when uh, when it's all over. That's how that's how the political system in the United States works, the corruption in the political system. They don't really get you before, to be quite honest. They get you after. They'll, we'll get you when you're done being president. That's when you'll get your, your big payday. Sometimes they, they, they pay you before. I mean, who knows? Um, you got guys like, like Austin, who was, who, who was, I think he was. I don't know if he still is. He, he may still be on the board of, uh, what is it, Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or, or whatever. I mean, oh, man. Anyway. <laughs> Jeez. Unbelievable recording. I'm, I'm still kind of kind of shocked at, at what I heard, even though you know it's happening. It's one thing that, that, that you know it's happening. That's one thing. But when you actually hear it in such detail, it, it just leaves you stunned. Anyway, uh, Lavrov was in the U.S. at the United Nations attending a session of the Security Council at the U.N. And he gave an interview to CBS News. And <laughs> what a great interview from Lavrov. I mean, the guy is, is, is just amazing. One of the best, if not the best, foreign minister in, in the world. Um, <laughs> Lavrov, he was asked by CBS News about the, the voting at the Security Council and 140 votes against Russia and, and stuff like that from the CB, CBS News uh, journalist. And Lavrov was like, look, you know, we don't really care about that vote because I know people at the UN Security Council. I know everyone here. They talk to me. They like me, and they told me that they're being pressured by the U.S. to, to vote for whatever resolution the U.S. puts forth. And the U.S. goes to them and says, you know, you have your kid in, in Stanford, and we can make it difficult on your kid, or you have a bank account here in the U.S., or whatever. They, they put pressure on them in, uh, in those types of ways. And, uh, and then the CBS News reporter, oh, my God, she goes, so, so are you telling me that most UN countries are pressured by the USA? That's what she asks Lavrov. And Lavrov's like, not most, all. <laughs> He's like, all of them. When he said that, I was like, oh man, someone's got to create a meme. Like when Lavrov says, not most, all. <laughs> they should create a meme where like, the, the, the what is that? I think it's like the Snoop Dogg music plays and... And, and the sunglasses come down on Lavrov and the cigarette. <laughs> oh, man, Lavrov. Someone should create that meme. That was, that was awesome. It was awesome. He also said that uh, a Trump presidency is not going to change anything going on in Ukraine, Project Ukraine. He was, he was not optimistic about any type of change if Trump were to be president. Lavrov said, look. Bush, Obama, all the U.S. presidents, Trump, they've all, uh, they've all gone back on, on various agreements. Uh, specifically, he, he cited various um, uh, ballistic missiles, nuclear, nuclear weapons agreements. He's like, Bush, Bush went back on, on, on this agreement, and Trump went back on this one. He's like, it's, it's not going to make any difference. So that's what Trump said about, that's what uh, Lavrov said about a Trump uh, presidency. And he also said that the U.S. was blocking an investigation into Nord Stream. That's why we haven't been able to get to, to any type of, uh, of resolution with what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline. And he said that Europe just sits there humiliated by the United States <laughs> because 
Germany's pipeline was blown up and the U.S. is not allowing any type of investigation and Europe just sits there and takes it. So sticking with Europe and the EU, Reuters is reporting that the EU will not seize Russian frozen assets. It will not seize the frozen assets, according to Reuters. Seize, not freeze. <laughs> Ursula van der Crazy. We will seize, not freeze. <laughs> well, it looks like they're going to stay frozen, Ursula. That's the way it looks. But I'm still betting on the fact that, that the Biden White House is going to get the G7 and the Europeans to cave in. <laughs> That's what I'm betting on. But for now, Reuters is saying that the EU is against it. They're not, they're, well, they're not against it. They just can't find the legal loopholes to, to get around stealing Russia's frozen assets. The Reuters article has the title, EU Unlikely to Confiscate Russian Central Bank Assets, according to officials. Reuters says that such a confiscation of so sovereign assets would be unprecedented. It could also scare off investors from around the world concerned that their money would not be safe in the EU. And Luxembourg Foreign Minister uh, Javier Batal told Reuters he was very cautious about seizing Russian assets. Imagine if we decide politically to give billions to Ukraine and in six months we have a judicial decision saying we are not allowed to give it to them. Who will we pay then? Patel said. So that is the story with the Russian frozen assets for now. For now, I still believe that the EU will, will cave. That's what I believe. So, uh, let's see. What should we talk about now? Ah, Asia Times. How about this article from Asia Times? Actually, Asia Times, they republished this article from a Substack account. And uh, this article from Asia Times, let me find the, the Substack that this was taken from. Because this is an interesting article and it actually confirms all of the reporting that uh, we have been doing on the Duran and on this channel. Uh, a lot of stuff that I talked about yesterday with regards to Danov, a shift in the strategy of the fighting and conflict Ukraine from a conventional war to an insurgency war, uh, getting Budanov to, to run everything, Zeluzhny um, being exited, Budanov coming in. And, and this basically confirms much of the reporting. And uh, this article was published on Asia Times originally in, in the Weapons and Security Substack by Stephen Bryan, who served as a staff director of the Near East Subcommittee of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Currently, he is a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy and Yorktown Institute. So this article... This article says some very, very interesting things. It, uh, let me find it here. It confirms that in the U.S. government, in the Biden administration, there is a new policy that is being worked out, and it's been, and, and it's been discussed for many months because the Biden White House has understood that uh, they have lost the conventional war. And the article says, putting aside the credibility or lack thereof of any imminent Russian threat to Europe, the U.S. is changing its policy and is recognizing that it cannot win a conventional war against Russia, which also means that it can't win a conventional war against China maybe not even Iran or the minuscule Houthis. All of this is clearly visible in Iraq, where U.S. bases and installations are regularly bombed by Iranian militias. Following orders from Tehran, their goal is for U.S. troops to leave Iraq and Syria, and accomplishing that, demonstrate that the U.S. 
is unreliable and unfit to depend on. The new Ukraine policy has been emerging over recent months. If understood correctly, the policy is designed to deal with the new reality that Ukraine will lose the war and Ukraine's government may need to evacuate Kiev, putting Budanov in effective control, including for the relocation of Ukraine's capital, probably to Lviv, is the bedrock of the policy. Operationally, the policy will likely, will likely be to use special operations, assassinations, bombings, and any other means, including possibly blowing up a nuclear reactor to punish the Russians and keep them off balance. Alensky is already setting the stage by saying Russia will blow up a nuclear reactor. The Russians are no doubt keenly aware that the target will be a reactor in western Ukraine and it will be Ukrainian saboteurs who undertake the mission. So there you have it. Confirmation of the reporting that we have been doing over the past couple of days. And then the article in the final paragraphs go, goes on to explain what the goals of the Biden White House uh, are with this, with this new policy, this shift from conventional to insurgency war. It says that for Washington, there are three imperatives. The first is to be able to keep the war going and to keep demanding money from Congress. This is a hard act because if Ukraine is collapsing, it will be hard to get buy-in for a losing proposition. The second imperative is to keep a pro-Western Ukraine government functioning, even if it has to abandon Kiev. It also means that the current government has to survive politically. If a coup d'etat happens, then all bets are off. So Washington needs to prevent the political breakdown. This is a tall order because Ukrainians are understandably unhappy, in fact, miserable, as young and old men are forced to fight a losing war and many of them don't come home. And the third imperative is to keep Russia out of Europe, meaning to keep European countries from cutting their own deals with Moscow. As Kiev goes, so goes Europe and NATO. There you have it. Those are the three imperatives from this article republished on Asia Times. And there's an article on the Daily Beast, from the Daily Beast, which actually talks about how, uh, how people are miserable in Ukraine, especially men who fear being uh, snapped up while they're, uh, while they're walking on the streets and put into a van and being taken to the front line. And the article from the Daily Beast, they interview like three or four uh, Ukrainians some of them who are still in Ukraine, others who have uh, fled to Europe. And they basically say, look, uh, we don't want to go to the front lines. We've heard from many people, including many friends of ours, that uh, they, send, they send you to the front lines with only weeks of training, not months of training, weeks of training. And uh, you're not ready to, to be a soldier, but they send you to the front lines anyway, and, and you face... You face death, you face uh, injury, um, psychological problems, the Daily Beast reports as they're interviewing these guys. And, and that's the article from the Daily Beast. The title is The Real Reason Thousands Are Fleeing Conscription in Ukraine. The article talks about how the mobilization process is a, is a complete disaster, how the Alensky regime is looking for 500,000 people to mobilize, but they can't find anybody, and it admits that uh, the Ukraine military, they're running around the cities in Kiev trying to grab whoever they can. And uh, people are hiding out in their homes. Some people hide out in other apartments uh, where, where their registered address, which, which is not their registered address in order to evade the, the military. And other people manage to, uh, to leave the country by saying that they have a disability or that one of their, their family members has a disability and they need to care for them in Europe. Uh, but now it's getting very hard for, for young men to leave. It talks about how the Alensky regime is getting pressure to recruit uh, university students and, uh, and teenagers. And the whole thing is a complete mess, a complete disaster. And uh, you read this article from the Daily Beast and you understand that this war is absolutely lost.
It's not only absolutely lost, it's, it's a crime what the Alensky regime is doing by, by continuing to, to pursue this conflict, knowing that, that they're going to lose, knowing that they're losing, and knowing that the people that they sent to the front are not anywhere near um, uh, capable to, uh, to fight against the Russian military. And they know this, but they're just, they're just rounding up people and, and training them for a week or two, and they send them to the front. It's a really depressing article, to be quite honest. A very, very depressing article. And this is coming from the Daily Beast. This is not coming from RT or TASS. This is the Daily Beast. So uh, that, uh, that is the article from the Daily Beast. And uh, Russia, yesterday they launched uh, a bunch of strikes into, uh, into Ukraine. Basically, these strikes hit Kiev. They hit uh, Kharkov and also Pavlograd, which is an interesting uh, area, city, for the strikes to, to target. But uh, Kharkov, Kharkov, the Russians have been, have been really targeting Kharkov. And uh, Peskov came out with a statement and said that these strikes have nothing to do with the terror attack in Donetsk on the food market. This is not a retaliation to, to that attack. Peskov said that uh, Russia, the Russian military, doesn't operate like that, unlike the Ukraine military. He said that Russia doesn't engage in retaliations, um, especially against, um, against civilian targets. He said the goal of these, of these strikes, once again, is, is military infrastructure. And that is what the Russian Defense Minister Ministry has been reporting, that these uh, missile strikes they hit all kinds of Ukrainian uh, military factories and Ukraine military infrastructure. But we are getting reports, and these are rumors, just rumors, that uh, in Kharkov, the Russian military once again took out French, air quotes, mercenaries. Just rumors. These are just rumors, but who knows? Let me read you a tweet from Matt Nilsson. Rumors, the French got it again in Kharkov. There's information that today's strike in Kharkov was carried out on the officials from the French Ministry of Defense at the time of handing over to them the identified bodies of French military intelligence officers who died during the previous strike. No proof as of yet from what I can find. So there is no proof of this. These are just rumors. But, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if if once again the Russians managed to locate French mercenaries, as they are called, and, and once again hit those uh, French mercenaries. So um, that was the, the strikes that took place yesterday. Peskov also said that, uh, that the comments from Alensky about the six regions in, uh, in Russia that are Ukrainian or belong to Ukraine, that comment that he made yesterday, the, the decree that uh, he announced yesterday. Peskov said that, uh, that Alensky is, uh, well, he's delusional. He's, uh, he's making stupid comments. He said that actually the comment was not merely stupid, but rather an attempt to distract everyone from the problems that are piling up in Kiev. He said that, but he also said that uh, that Alensky is trying to get back the overwhelming popular support, and he really wants to be like, for example, President Putin, so that the entire nation will support him. But it isn't working out that way. More and more people in Ukraine are starting to think that maybe the Kiev regime is doing something wrong. So yeah, Peskov said that Alensky wants to wants to be like Putin, and that is why he is coming out with these these comments trying to be as popular he wants to be as popular as putin and that is why he is coming out with these comments to be like putin i remember there used to be a michael uh, a gatorade michael jordan commercial i don't know if you guys remember that commercial and uh, it had a really catchy song 
to be like Mike. Everybody wants to be like Mike because Michael Jordan is, uh, is the GOAT, right? And uh, everyone wants to be like Mike. That was the Gatorade commercial. Maybe, maybe Gatorade should put out another commercial and say, be like Putin. Everyone wants to be like Putin. Because you know the, the Collective West leaders, you know that deep down inside, they really do want to be like Putin or as popular as Putin. You know it. That, that's one of the reasons they hate him so much. It's jealousy. Jealousy always drives a lot of hate. A lot of hate comes through jealousy. That's why Biden hates Putin. That's why uh, Schultz hates Putin. Uh, that's why Merkel hated Putin. Annalena Habeck. Uh, Klaus Schwab. Trudeau, Rutte, you name them. You name them. The reason they, they despise Putin is because deep down inside, they're jealous of his popularity. So, anyway, <laughs> interesting comment from Peskov. How are we doing on time? It is super windy here on this beautiful uh, beach. And uh, let's hope the audio is okay <laughs> for this video. So, uh, an interesting story from, uh, from Hungary. The Hungarian foreign minister, Mr. Peter Siarto, one of the best foreign ministers in the world, he's going to be traveling to Uzgorod to meet with uh, the foreign minister of Ukraine, Mr. Kalua Kuleba. And before his trip, he got death threats, serious death threats. And these death, death threats, according to various reports, are coming from, or at least are written in the Ukrainian language. So let me read you what's going on here. Speaking to reporters in Brussels on Tuesday, Siarto said that a threatening message had been sent to Hungary's embassy in Ukraine. A day earlier, Hungarian news site Index published the text of the message, which read, Hungarians, we hate your government, which continues to do everything to make us lose the war. Do you think that your minister will just come to us after the attacks on Ukraine? We don't think so. On January 29th, Siarto's delegation can expect an explosive welcome. An armored train will not save you. We recommend that you place an order with a funeral home so that they can start making the coffin for Siarto to fit his height. God forgives, but Ukrainians do not. I'm reading you the exact quote as translated from the, from the site index. So the message was written in Ukrainian and sent to the embassy via email. Index reported. Siarto said that whoever wrote the message did so with the clear aim of casting a shadow over the meeting of foreign ministers next Monday and preventing it from taking place. Those who think that the Hungarian foreign minister is scared, they don't know Peter Siarto. Pressure and threats only make us stronger. That is what Hungarian State Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Tamás Menzer, wrote on social media on Tuesday. Interesting development there. So that is, that is Project Ukraine. That is Project Ukraine. Let's see here. Let's do a couple more stories. Let's walk a little bit. Do a couple more stories. We'll get to my clown world. We'll wrap this video up. So NATO, uh, they, uh, they announced that they put together this big scheme to to produce or purchase produce and purchase something like 1.2 million uh, ammunition shells 155 ammunition shells and nato is boasting about this they're going to take on russia because now they're going to produce all of these shells but uh the the, the deal is going to, to finish up in like 2027 2028 like in two three years is when they'll have all of these uh these shells to take on russia so uh, all about the money. This is all about the money. But um, 
Stoltenberg as he was talking about this, this awesome development from NATO. He was asked about all the threats that, uh, that NATO countries are making, Germany and Estonia and all the Baltic nations, that uh, Russia is going to, to wage war with them. And he was asked about this, and uh, Stoltenberg was like, well, you know, to be, to be quite honest, he's like, we don't really see any, any threats from Russia as NATO. Not even Stoltenberg could lie and say that Russia is about to attack NATO countries. He's like, we don't really see Russia attacking us anytime soon. Let me find you his direct quote if I have it. If I have it. Maybe I have it, maybe I don't. Let's see here. What exactly did he say? Yeah, we don't see any direct or imminent threats against any NATO ally. <laughs> That's the quote. I took all that time to find you that one quote. <laughs> That's it. So yeah, all of this nonsense about Russia's going to attack Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia and Germany and all these videos about Russia attacking Berlin. It's just all nonsense. It's all about fear. They just want to scare the people of Europe so that more money can go to the MIC and so that the European leaders can uh, centralize more power and control. That's it. That is it. That's what this is all about. Not even Stoltenberg could lie about uh, the truth, which is that Russia is not. Um, is, is that a right? Not even Stoltenberg could lie about the truth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? <laughs> not even Stoltenberg could lie about this one. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to, uh, to a clown world. <laughs> oh, boy. A couple of stories before the clown world. Uh, Turkey's parliament, from what I understand, they have approved Sweden's accession to NATO. So I guess Erdogan, he just has to sign, sign off on, uh, on the parliament's decision. Hungary's the only country left, and that's it. Sweden is in NATO. So that is the, you know, that's the consolation prize that NATO gets from this two-year project Ukraine conflict. The consolation prize for NATO is Sweden and Finland. That's it. That's going to be NATO's victory out of all of this. We also had uh, the news that uh, coming from Canada that the counterterrorism law used by Trudeau's government to arrest leaders of the Freedom Convoy and search and seize property and persons involved in the anti-mandate demonstration which arrived in Ottawa in January 28, 2022 was deemed unconstitutional by a judge. Democracy under Justin Trudeau. So, unconstitutional. All of Trudeau's antics and his authoritarian, his authoritarian antics during the, uh, the convoy. In 2022, was it, was it really that long ago? 2022, huh? So yeah, that's, uh, that's the decision from the Supreme Court. So, so maybe now they can, uh, they can investigate the whole NAZI in the parliament thing as well. <laughs> anyway, let's do a clown world. Wrap this video up. And... This is coming from the Kiev Independent. CIA's new video encourages Russian spies to collaborate. The video was published under the headline, Why I Contacted the CIA for the Motherland in the Russian Language on January 22nd on Twitter X. So the CIA, they, uh, they put a recruitment video, I guess you could call it on Twitter X. They published it on Twitter X in Russian in order to recruit spies, traitors, Russians who are willing to, to work for the CIA and to sell their country out. And they published this on X. Why is this a clown world? Well, 
A few months ago when I was in Moscow, there were many sites that were blocked and you cannot access those sites unless you had a VPN. And one of those sites was uh, Twitter, Twitter X. You could not access it unless you were using a VPN. So I guess the clown world is that while there will be people who do access Twitter in Russia via VPN, a majority of people are not using VPNs to surf the internet. So I don't know if the CIA really thought this ad placement out uh, too well, <laughs> you know. Um, I, you can access uh, Google, YouTube, you can access all of those services without a VPN, but Twitter X, nope. You needed VPN to get out to Twitter in Russia. So why place an ad in, Ru in Russian, in the Russian language on Twitter X? Don't know. But uh, you know, I've, I've always had the impression that Twitter, while it's popular in Russia, it wasn't like a huge social media site. That was always the impression I got uh, when I've been to Russia about Twitter. Every time I, vi I visited Russia and, and uh, talked about Twitter with other people, it didn't seem like it was that popular of a site. Instagram uh, was much more popular and probably still is much more popular as a social media site in Russia than, than Twitter X. Anyway, that's the video, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 15% off all t-shirts. Take care. <laughs>